epic. This is what I signed up for when I was like, let's read some epic fantasy. Epic. What's good, wannabes, lovelies? Welcome to my channel. Brando Sando is back with the fourth book in the Stormlight Archive series, Rhythm of War. And I've just finished reading Oathbringer. I didn't want to wait between Oathbringer and Rhythm of War, so I actually finished the book the day Rhythm of War came out. So yes, today I'm going to be discussing Oathbringer and I will make a review for Rhythm of War once I've finished reading that so make sure you like and subscribe for that. This video is going to contain many spoilers but everyone has already read this book because I'm so late on the train so we don't need to worry about that, let's just get going. Okay, the way I'm going to do this review, I'm going to go character by character and then we're just going to do the whole finale section all at once. So, in the beginning of this book, there's been a murder. There's these mysterious double murders that are happening. The gang is basically trying to figure out what is happening with that. While Dalinar is like off playing politician, Kaladin goes to visit his family and Shalan and Adolin, Adolin are trying to figure out what is going on with these murders whilst Adolin is hiding the fact that he actually murdered High Prince Sadius. <laughs> so, character number one, Shalan. <laughs> I love Shalan so much, she's one of my faves. And this book really broke her down to build her back up. She's in the middle of this identity crisis, but in true Shalan style, instead of dealing with anything, she just represses it and ignores it. Instead, she just creates more and more and more personas who can deal with her problems better than she can. And she separates them from herself because she sees Shalan as like weak and incapable, but then she sees these versions of herself which are also her as like powerful and strong. One of my favourite Shalan scenes for this book was when good old hoity boy Wit shows up. So Wit is finishing off the story that Shalan already started, the girl who looked up. Uh, basically there's this girl, she's in a walled city. They tell her that there's bad stuff out there but nobody really knows what. And she's like, you know what, I'm gonna have a look at what this wall is about. And then she goes up the wall and sees on the other side of the wall there's actually a staircase. So it turns out that the wall wasn't to keep the village safe. It was actually to keep the villagers out of the city next door. If that ain't a metaphor for the whole switcheroo that happens later with the, you know, humans being the void bringers, I don't know what is. Shalan is the character hands down that I relate most to. Like her whole identity crisis thing. <laughs> How every time she's trying to deal with a problem, instead of facing it, she just dodges it. She'll just keep it down, she'll try and forget about it, she'll lock it away, she'll repress it until it just bubbles up and up and up and then she can't handle it anymore. She really does hate being Shalan for some reason, so she spends most of this book as Vale. When Vale ends up like royally screwing up these beggars she was trying to help, Shalan completely like crumbles and loses it. And she's like, I can't do anything right. And I'm like, bro, we're having the same mental breakdowns, the same crisis at the same time. <laughs> Too relatable. At this point she doesn't even know if she can continue with life. Wit comes along and has a little chat with her and I've never really been a huge fan of Wit. Like I've never really found him funny. The only reason I like Wit is because Wit is Hoyd. <laughs> I like it more when Hoyd is mysterious and not like trying too hard but since this book my mind has been changed and now I absolutely love Wit. But there's one thing he says to her that just like really stuck out to me. He says there are certain things I know, Shalan. This is one of them. You can. Find the balance. Accept the pain. But don't accept that you deserve it. Wit! Wit! Yes. We love and stand wit. Okay, then we have Yasna. So basically, Yasna's back. We find out that she's an L scholar and she was able to escape death by going into Shadesmar. But we don't really know the details of how that happened and how that worked yet. But I'm guessing we'll find that out in Rhythm of War. So when she comes back, <laughs> okay, so there's this little gripe that I have with like Brandon Sanderson's books, especially Stormlight Archive, because I haven't really noticed it in his other books. And it's the reactions of people. I feel like the reactions are missing sometimes. Like Yasna literally came back from the dead and I I feel like more people should have been shocked about that. And also, even when Yasna died, I'm like, it's like Shalan was distraught. Like she was properly upset. But then Yasna's own family <laughs> were not as upset as Shalan, who's known her for a few months. 
you need to see their reactions to her death and their reactions to her being alive as well but one thing i do love that sanderson does is how he drops in random nuggets of knowledge throughout his books just one line of information that we've never heard before and then just like acts oh yeah yeah it's just casual like everybody knows this and i'm like hmm in one of dalinar's flashbacks they mentioned that Yasna is locked up because of her lunacy. Oh, uh, what's that about? <laughs> is that, that's cool. I want to see. I want to know what's happening with that. Like, is it just her lunacy? Like, she's seeing things like Shalan did in the beginning. So they think that she's like crazy. Or is it something more nefarious than that? I just love when we see cracks in Yasna's facade. When we see her anxieties and her struggle like i just love those moments and renarin i i'm gonna mess up all these names because i rarely speak out loud about these books he's been acting so shady this whole book since the beginning i was like is renarin the one doing these murders and then i got in my head that like he was being possessed by like a spread of odium and it was like making him do odium's bidding like making him light weave these like shadow things. That it was a complete reach. Turns out it's just an unmade. But that scene with the unmade was really, really cool. Like I like how it's something like switched to like a horror level of creepiness as they're like being chased by this dark figure. And his visions are confirmed to be visions of the future. Oh, in the end, when he sees something happens to Dalinar and you're like, no, no but we'll we'll get there when we get there so kaladin throughout this book he's off doing his own adventures he meets his family um and he hangs out with the posh people for a bit the voidies but he actually starts to like really bond with them like he just sees them as normal people and kaladin obviously being a slave he understands some of the struggles that they went through as slaves but then not quite because they literally lost their minds as well as their freedom like and it's all about Kaladin's struggle with pr being able to protect people like that's been his whole struggle since book one he couldn't protect Tian and now he couldn't protect these people because he had to betray them in the end so throughout this book he's trying to say the fourth ideal about being able to protect people but he just can't bring himself to say it because he's still wondering about stuff like why is it honorable to kill the parshendi but it's dishonorable to let el hoka die or something like that and then sil just says it's because we make up what we say is honorable like there's no one thing that's honorable and one thing that's dishonorable um along his travels he also comes across azure azure as soon as we met azure i was like hmm okay who are you all right, let's see. And then we get confirmation that Azur's a woman. I'm like, it's Vivenna. It's 100% Vivenna. Like, we've seen Basha and Nightblood. So where is Vivenna? And then a random mysterious woman shows up. It was like, so perfect. It didn't even clock on to me that Azur is literally the name of a color until today. <laughs> she a dumb hoe, but it's okay. <laughs> we've also got Teft, good old Teft. Uh, we basically find out with him that he's like a drug addict. Oh, the Tef chapters were so sad. Like he's just struggling so much. Like Kaladin, he just is trying so hard to say the fourth ideal, but he just can't bring himself to say it. Tef feels like useless in um, Bridge 4 because of his addiction. And now that they have money, he's basically finding it harder to resist, like spending it on the drug. Yeah, it was quite a heartbreaking situation with Tef. Venli? Venli. Venli was in so much of this book, but I literally couldn't really care less. <laughs> I love Eshenai so much. And when I was reading Venli bits, I was just like, this is like B-Tech Eshenai. <laughs> uh, I mean, she's fine, obviously, like Venli, but like, I wasn't as interested. What I did like was the fact that she has a little friend called... Tumbra, which is like a musical term and so she's bonded with a void spren but then she's also got this other spren that she bonds with at the end i was assuming that um rhythm of war was gonna be about eshenai and then we find eshenai dead now it's confirmed that it's gonna be following well eshenai is gonna be there obviously but it's gonna be mainly following venli i guess i don't know i really have avoided spoilers so i haven't read edge dancer or dawn shard or 
read anything online <laughs> for the last year i've avoided all spoilers to do with this okay now the biggest point of view the one that we've been waiting for the book who this is dedicated to balana my baby my zaddy <laughs> and i can't say that <laughs> so i'm gonna get kicked out of this fandom if i say that so dalana is politicking and he's trying to gather up these people to form the knights radiant again and like get people going to defeat the posh and the void bringers so this is his book right so this means we get his flashbacks and oh boy these flashbacks were juicy they were sourceful flashbacks like there was some flavor in there these flashbacks were men's food <laughs> it starts off when he starts remembering his wife and as soon as he remembers the name all these flashbacks get triggered <laughs> The way they mistreated this poor woman, Evie, it literally aggravated me to no end. Everyone was so xenophobic, especially Dalana, especially Dalana and Navani. He would say things like, oh, why can't you be such a good Alephi wife like the rest of the women here? Maybe because she's not Alephi. And all the women would call her stupid and it just aggravated me. Oh, she tried to eat with her safe hand. <laughs> and what? And what? Square up! I will throw hands for Evie. She's so precious, so pure, she did not deserve that. I will literally throw hands for Evie. Catch me outside, how about that? The great thing about these flashbacks is we get to see the true Blackthorn. We've heard about the Blackthorn for so long. We've heard the atrocities that Dalana has committed. But I never really understood the full scope of who the Blackthorn was because Dalana is such an honourable kind and perfect almost person now you can't really imagine dalana now doing anything as bad as the blackthorn's reputation would state now i completely understand why people were scared of him and thought he was a tyrant everybody knows like the iconic scene when he's eating the steak and his knife is blunt so he's like oh, i need a new knife and then he goes to find one can't find one comes back an assassin tries to kill Gavala. He takes the assassin's knife, kills the assassin, and then uses his knife, washes it in the wine, and then carries on eating his steak. He's like, ah, oh, perfect knife. This is great. And the whole table is like... So we see that Dalana has literally gotten everything he's ever wanted in life through brute force and tyranny. And although I do hate Amaram, there was this one moment where I was kind of like, you know what, Amaram? You may be stupid, but you make some sense. <laughs> Let us read. I respect you greatly, Bright Lord, Amaram said, but you, and take this with the respect I intend, are a hypocrite. You stand where you do because of a brutal determination to do what had to be done. It is because of that trail of corpses that you have the luxury to uphold some lofty nebulous code. Well, it might make you feel better about your past, but morality is not a thing you can simply doff to put on the helm of battle, then put back on when you're done with the slaughter. And that's on colonialism. I can't. That's so true. I can't. I'm, I'm around. Why are you making sense all of a sudden? That's not allowed. <laughs> so time and time again, Evie is just like, she's trying so hard to be a good wife for Dalana. And time and time again, Dalana is a massive dick. <laughs> After not seeing his kids for years, he's like, oh, hey, Adeline. Hey, the other weak one that I don't really care about. My poor kid, honestly. This all leads up to what we are actually reading these flashbacks for. What happened to Dalana's wife? From the moment we find out that he can't remember her, I'm thinking he's killed her. But how? Dalana's betrayed by Tanalan, Tanalan, Tanalan. That night, Evie goes to speak to Tanalan to try and like, I don't know. And he takes her prisoner and then sends a message to Dalana. Dalana straight up murks the messenger without even re like finding out what the message was. And then the next day storms in and burns down the entire village, like everything. Children, like the prison, the palace, everything is burnt to a crisp. And yeah, then he finds out that, you know, Evie was, Evie was in that prison and now she did. Or Kipu. Literally, so many people perished because Dalna can't handle his anger issues. Like, I had to pause after this. I was just like, why? <laughs> oh, Evie tried so hard. Tried so hard to make you a good person. She died because of it. This is why you shouldn't 
you shouldn't try and prove anybody but what annoyed me wasn't the fact that he killed his wife it was the fact that after he killed his wife he didn't take any responsibility for it he kind of was like oh it was her fault for running into the village which yeah okay it kind of was but like at the same time you didn't have to burn and kill innocent people like and then after that he just lied and lied and lied and then when things were getting too tough he just forgets about his wife and he can live happily like he took like no responsibility for like a whole lifetime of murder and that's not okay this is the black thorn this is the black thorn that we've heard about and I love reading about it. Don't get me wrong, I'm acting like I'm annoyed, but I love the juiciness of this. The sourcefulness of it is great. So we also finally meet Odium, and it was so unexpected because he's a gentle old shin man. He's like, oh, hey, I'm Odium. He also mentions that like Odium means passion. And as soon as he said that, I really should have connected the dots about, you know, the thrill. But that will come up again at the end of this. Then we have post Evie depressed Dalina, uh, who's an alcoholic, a terrible father, and just an all round awful human. <laughs> it was actually very heartbreaking to read that. Like there was the one scene where they're hiding all the alcohol from him. Renarin comes in and is like, oh, I spent all my pocket money to get you this um, wine to make you happy. And then Dalina just like breaks down and they like hug and like, ah. Uh, but yeah, the most important Dalinar scene, obviously, is when he goes to see the Night Watcher. It is now confirmed the Night Watcher is not Cultivation, and Cultivation is out there in some valley forest thing majig. And the Night Watcher is a child of Cultivation, or somehow a shadow of Cultivation, or basically they're linked, but they're not the same thing. So Cultivation is just out there somewhere. I mean, this was like five years ago when this happened, so maybe she's hidden somewhere else. But I'm like, how has she managed to hide from Odium? Like, how are they doing this whole cat and mouse situation? Like, where do you hide? But I'm still not entirely sure why she actually wiped Dalinar's memory because he was speaking to the Night Watcher and the Night Watcher was like, oh, I don't know if I can do that for you. And then Cultivation's like, ah, I'll do it for you. But like, why? What, what are her plans for Dalinar? I'm guessing we'll find that out soon. We can't get onto part five without talking about risen first oh risen she's now in a wheelchair because of the jump that she did and she's very depressed about the fact that she can't really be a merchant anymore so wisdom comes to visit her and is like i know what will make you feel better a boat which i just find really funny because in every like sweet moment of like gift sharing in a fantasy book like there's always like a guy getting a girl a boat <laughs> like why <laughs> girls don't want makeup they want a boat so yeah anyway this thief comes in steals this massive ruby that's in the vault that where risen works kills the stim and oh the little flying thing cheery cheery comes in and saves the day so cute but cheery cheery is that thing that we saw with lift right that like sucks out the storm light the like void light void light is that what it's called <sighs> now we have the big finale part five the end the, the last 200 pages of a sanderson book like you just need to expect to not stop at all like not even to breathe so shalane has got this whole army of illusions that she's just like controlling and then it's kaladin versus amaram zeth x nightblood x lift versus the fuse trying to get the ruby and then you have dalana versus odium <laughs> and then just a bunch of other people in other places Part five, I was just like stressed. You think Yasna's gonna kill Renarin at some point, and then Dalina is gonna become Odium's champion, and I'm like, this can't happen. When Odium starts getting to him, he's like, hey Dalina. I'm scared, you know, you can come and join me, like, just come and join me, like, it'd be really, really fun. I promise you, everything will be really, really good if you just join me. Like, you won't feel guilty about anything bad that you've ever done. Because I'm actually the one that made you do that. You see, the passion that you feel in the thrill, that's all me. And the thrill is what drove you to commit all the crimes you've done, all the murder and slaughtering. It's what made you love it so much. So, you should just let me take the full responsibility and the full blame for it. And you can just kind of feel down our slipping slowly, like, he's kind of enticed by this idea. And the audience is like, come on, come on, come on, come just join me, just join me. Just let me take your pain away, it'll be all good, it'll be all good, fine, then. You cannot have my pain. Pain. Sorry, I didn't Sorry, quite catch you. You get out of my face. Grabs the physical realm with one arm, grabs the cognitive realm with one arm, and like bonds them together. Epic. 
like this is what I signed up for when I was like, let's read some epic fantasy. Epic. The most epic part of it is he's finally taking accountability. He admits to killing all of those people. He admits that although the thrill was driving him, he made those choices himself. He's finally taking full responsibility for everything. <laughs> the first ideal says journey before destination. And I felt like by seeking out the night watching, he skipped a huge chunk of this journey to allowing himself to be forgiven. In this book, I feel like he really went through that journey of knowing who he was in the past and being able to use that and move forward and actually grow as a person. He even says that every journey has to begin somewhere and this is his new beginning. And then people just start saying the ideals left, right and center. Kaladin says the fourth ideal. I swear to protect even those I hate. But what really got me kind of choked up was when Teft said the fourth ideal. Um, and then he adds, even if the one I hate the most is myself. <laughs> it really, it really meant a lot to me, honestly. Like the whole Teft arc was, was great. So Lyft finally gets the ruby to Dalana and then Dalana's like, Zhu, we're gonna trap the thrill inside of the ruby to keep it at bay like some sort of unalak situation you can't tell me that no one's gonna break the thrill out of the ruby at some point in this series and when that happens i'm gonna be very scared <laughs> so yeah it's all over i mean i did skip a bunch of stuff because we can't be here all day but then we have the wedding shalan adeline got married another big battle is over i feel like they're again avoiding the inevitable the void bringers void bringers <laughs> the fuse they've only just really discovered what they are they're definitely gonna bounce back and come back stronger and the desolations they're just gonna keep on coming they need to come up with a solid plan on what they're gonna do to stop these desolations coming what they're gonna do about the fused there's so much to sort out <laughs> still so when it comes to the desolations there's really only three options i think for how they can sort that out number one destroy the pact or they destroy odium i'm not really sure the details on how the pact works so i'm not sure how they can go about doing that they've got to find a way to do that the second idea is that they create a new set of heralds and these heralds continue the cycle of going to brays and serving their time Oh, the third option, which I feel like is a very unconventional option, I haven't really heard anyone talk about this. What if they just leave? What if they leave the planet? Like, I know the humans now, it's their home, but like, perhaps maybe they could find a new planet? I mean, that's what they did in the first place. They came here from somewhere else, so maybe they could find another uninhabited planet and actually, like, live there instead. The thing is, like, would they be able to bring their surge binding abilities with them i think they would because you'd be able to bring your spren right and with the spren you'd still be able to surge bind okay you couldn't get stormlight but maybe they could be like lift where they don't necessarily need stormlight to activate their powers i still don't know enough about lift i really need to read edge dancer it's kind of a crack theory but it's it's a theory <laughs> the planet's gonna get destroyed like there's gonna be a huge war like this was not the big battle to end all battles so they still have time to decide whether they want to leave or not imagine like a mass exodus like israelites out of egypt style kaladin at the front leading everybody out we still have so many questions after every book i'm always thinking what's up with teravangian <laughs> like, i haven't really spoken about him yet but like he made a deal with odium and now he's on odium's side so i really i'm really excited to see what happens there and why can't he see Venarin? Please, if you know the answers to these or you have theories about these, please write them in the comment section. And another big question that stands out is that island, Aemia. We know that there's treasure there, but what else is on there? Like, why is there shards of rock sticking out of the sea? And why is there like a storm constantly surrounding it? What is on that island? Now, I have four different theories on what could be on that island. Number one theory, an oath gate. So I kind of doubt that there is, but then at the same time, I can't remember exactly who it was, but someone was looking for an oath gate and they mentioned looking on Aemia, I'm pretty sure. Number two, a herald. Maybe there's a herald there. I've only really included this on the list because we're looking for some heralds. I mean, there's a place that's kind of hidden, so maybe it could be there. Number three, cultivation. Where's she been for the last five years? Where has she been? On an island full of treasure, maybe? 
And number four, which I think is the most likely one, is a Dawn Shard. <laughs> the next book is called Dawn Shard. And I think it's set in Aemia. It makes it really obvious that there's probably going to be a Dawn Shard on Aemia. Excited to see what that's all about. And excited to see Risen hopefully travelling there with her boat and figuring all that out. That's going to be fun. Aside from plot, there's three main Brando Sando things that just irk me. Since Mistborn Era 1, I've been yelling <laughs> to my friends about this. <sighs> Number one, the lack of LGBT representation. Okay, now this isn't something that I'd usually point out in a book series because I'm like, okay, yeah, if, if all the characters are straight, then all the characters are straight. That's like, okay, sure. It's not just one book. Eight books, so many universes, so many worlds, so many magical systems, so many cultures, so many everything. Never once has there been a confirmed LGBT character. That doesn't make any sense. But in this book, Brando Sando came through and we have Drahi being gay here. We have Yasna confirmed ace, maybe? Question mark? I'm pretty sure. And you can't convince me that Adeline doesn't have a fat crush on Kaladin. So we've seen some representation. Number two, <laughs> as I mentioned before, the pacing. Sometimes it's like really, really fast paced and sometimes things just like drag out so much. And like sometimes we get to see in excruciating detail things that I really couldn't care about and then we just breeze over huge like reactions and character moments. The third thing that really really irks me that I'd love to see addressed in Rhythm of War is the one that I feel like no one really talks about which it literally bothers me to no end and I can't help but think about it when I'm reading these books. Ugh, okay so a lot of people say that Brandon Sanderson can't write female characters and I would wholeheartedly disagree because I think his female characters are great. Like, he writes his female characters with just as much depth and nuance as his male characters. The thing that he just doesn't include within the female characters is female relationships. Like, ugh, it's absurd. If you see two characters in a Brandon Sanderson book and they're both female and they're not related, when they meet, they just immediately hate each other for no reason. I mean... Obviously there's a reason, like, oh she's really vapid, or oh she's lower class, or something. But they never get past that and like become friends, they just always stay in that level. Or if it's a situation like Tin and Shalan, where they'll become friends, but then one of them will betray them. Like there's no solid female friendships, and it's weird, like how is there so many characters and that there's literally none of them have there's no two females that are friends and it just astounds me that he's managed to write so many books where this is not the case i mean that being said i haven't read all of his books obviously i've just read nine of them but come on nine books with not a single two female characters who are friends <sighs> brando sando please give me just a good female friendship in rhythm of war and i'll be happy Okay, so that was my review of Oathbringer. Overall, I did love this book. Like, even the little gripes that I have, it didn't take away from this being, like, for me, a 5 out of 5 book. It took me, like, four months to read this book. Like, it was a long time. So some of the details from the beginning, I have kind I may have forgotten. So if I do get anything wrong, please feel free to correct me and continue the discussion down below. Obviously I'm going to be reading Rhythms of War so if you want to see my reaction slash my review of the book be sure to subscribe and hit the like button. Also me and my friend did a Mistborn character quiz to find out which Mistborn characters we would be so if you're interested in that feel free to click. Okay thank you so much for getting all the way through this video. <sighs> Rhythms of War. I can't wait.